Welcome, oh happy warrior, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. I cannot think of a higher ranking salutation than happy warrior. And so it is to you, oh happy warrior, that I say welcome to the show where your rabbi reveals how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show, and as always, thank you for telling other people about it. I appreciate that very much. And, you know, let me tell you one of the the good things about money. And a happy warrior has a very realistic understanding of money. A happy warrior understands that money is a spiritual commodity, not a physical one. And a happy warrior realizes that uh, when people sometimes say, oh, he's just doing it for the money, a happy warrior realizes that that is falsehood of the, the most vile kind. Because when somebody is doing something for money, it's wonderful. It's not a discredit on the person. It's a good thing. Would you rather he was doing it for you for charity? because he felt sorry for you. That's why he was taking care of your needs, maybe painting your house or repairing your car or taking care of your tax return. Do you want him to do it just for charity? Or would you rather pay for it? I think I know the answer. Apart from anything else, if he's doing it for charity, then um, you don't really have the right to specify how you want it done. But if you're paying the person, it's wonderful. There's a professional relationship. He expects you to say, I'd like my haircut done in this particular way with a path on one side and uh, and I'd like a wave over here. But if you're receiving it because he's just feeling sorry for you and your hair is so bad, uh, th- that doesn't really give you the right to specify anything at all. And again, most of us professionals would much rather do something for money because it's clearly understood. I also find it much easier to interact with people when the relationship is one of money. Now, look, I'm not saying there's no occasion where sheer kindness is not. Pre- yeah, obviously, I'm not talking about that. I take it for granted. Clearly, there are times when we deliver goodness to other people purely out of a sense of of desire to help or be kind. Absolutely. But in general, the overwhelming majority of our interactions with people in, in order to obtain the things that we need and want in life are and should be for money. This is one of the great appeals that uh, people felt. Many people were not able to articulate it precisely, but one of the great appeals that President Trump had for so many voters in the United States of America was that they said to themselves, you know, he is a business professional. He's made money, and now he's trying to help the country in politics, not because of anything he might gain from it, because he's already gained The truth is that one really has to ask oneself, how smart is it really to vote for a politician who's never worked for a living? How smart is it to vote for somebody who has no contact and no experience with the reality of money? Why vote for somebody who's never had to make a payroll, somebody who's never had to pay employees? How can he possibly value money? He doesn't value his own, and he certainly won't value yours. And so uh, understanding how the world really works is very much a part of being a happy warrior. And it's quite wonderful to speak with people who do understand how the world really works. And that's why I consider the title Happy Warrior to be such a high-ranking title and descriptive of such an admirable type of person. So uh, welcome, and I feel enormously privileged, I feel enormously blessed to know that I am speaking to so many happy warriors. Now, I have no problem with uh, electrical 
cars. It's just that I wouldn't buy one because it doesn't make sense. If I were buying one, then I would have to recognize that the main reason I'd be buying one is to show everyone how much I care about the environment and carbon emissions and the climate because there's really very little reason to buy an electrical one on its current merits. Yeah, I, I do understand the beauty of an electrical motor which has a straight line torque curve, meaning that the motor delivers its maximum turning power even when it's just starting off. And it maintains that same turning power up through the RPM range as it turns more and more rapidly. This is not true for an internal combustion engine. Uh, when an internal combustion engine is running very slowly, when it's just idling, it doesn't have anything close to its maximum turning ability, to its maximum torque. And that's one of the reasons that uh, if you happen to have learned to drive on a stick shift, then you will remember that one of the most frequent early mistakes you made was stalling the car. You're in first gear, you let out the clutch, and the car stops running because you, you need a very well-modulated increase in engine speed by means of the accelerator beneath your right toe and uh, at the same time gently letting out the clutch so is that as you're increasing the torque, the turning power of the motor by increasing its speed, you're gradually allowing it to take up the load of starting to move the car. But uh, when one isn't experienced at it, that's when you stall. But an electric motor doesn't work that way. An electric motor develops huge turning ability right from the very start. So big advantage, no question. I also recognize that an electric motor has basically one moving part, whereas an internal combustion engine has more moving parts than one can even count. You know, you've got your crankshaft, you've got your pistons, you've got valves, you've got rocker arms, you've got camshafts, uh, you've got timing chains, you've got so much going on, and let alone the water circulation pump for the cooling system. And in general, the more moving parts, the more complicated and the more opportunity for failure. However, bottom line is that uh, the, the, the car engine today is such a finely engineered piece of machinery. And it is so evolved and so incredible that um, they really, really do work well. What, what a lot of people aren't aware of is that many uh, engines that are put into general aviation airplanes, uh, many engines that go into your Cirrus airplane, if you're lucky enough to, to have one, or into your uh, Cessna or whatever, en if you know, you've got a Lycoming or a Continental or whatever it is, many of the engines that go into these planes are car engines that have been slightly modified. They replace cast iron parts with aluminum parts to make them lighter and so on. But don't think of the car engine as something un reliable it's not it's a wonderful piece of equipment and um, you know many people will sometimes tell you well you can't use a car engine and a plane because a car engine can't run at 70 percent of its power for hours on end yes it can <laughs> it absolutely can that's simply not true uh, so the car engines are fine fine piece of engineering but i do understand that on, uh, on on certain levels the the electrical motor is superior but that's not all that makes a car a car depends on a thing called a battery, and that is very much more problematic. And I'll tell you why. One of the main reasons, just apart from, from anything else, uh, when I stop at a gas station, I need to fill up my 25-gallon fuel tank. It takes me about 120 seconds, and I'm done. 25 gallons, in we go, unless I happen to be at a gas station with very slow pumps. But otherwise, in it goes two minutes, I'm on my way. Now, with a, uh, in an electric car, you plug it in at a charging station, and you're looking at several hours. Uh, now, you, you will get half of it in pretty quickly, and that'll give you limited range. Uh, but the second half of the charge takes quite a long time. 
And, you know, it depends whether you're using a 240-volt charger or whether you're using a 110, but it's a lengthy process. If I want to fill only 12 and a half gallons, if I want to fill my car tank halfway, it'll take me exactly half of what it would have taken to fill it full. 120 seconds full, 60 seconds half, we're done. But with an electrical car, I can get the first half done in, you know, what, 20, 30 minutes sometimes, depending on the car and the charger. That's still 30 times more than the time I want to spend at a gas station. And so that is one of the huge problems. Now, let's talk about um, an announcement that was made this last week. I'm going to read you, first of all, the headline from the Fox Business Report, and then I'll read you the headline of the same story of the Reuters uh, report. Here is the Fox report. United Airlines to purchase 100 electric planes from Hart Aerospace. Hart Aerospace is a Swedish company, and uh, they are working on designing a 19-seat uh, commuter airplane um, they're hoping it's going to have a an operating range of about 200 miles and it's got four electric motors doesn't use any gasoline and uh, i think they're play they they are based in gothenburg in sweden uh, that is the fox business headline here's the reuters headline united airlines to buy 100 19 seat electric planes from hot aerospace Right, pretty much the same headline, except it adds that they're a 19-seat plane. Uni uh, Fox Business report said United Airlines to purchase 100 electric planes from Hart Aerospace. Now, wouldn't you be forgiven for assuming that uh, much of what I've told you in the past is probably not true? Because if United Airlines has bought or is in the process of buying a hundred planes that are electric planes, obviously these things work, right? And so all my concerns, which I have been unashamed to express to you over the past months, well, you know, obviously I must be wrong. But what I would urge you to do is to go beyond the headlines. So now we're going to dig into the story that appeared on Fox Business, and one has to go pretty far deep into the story to read the following sentence. Are you ready? United has conditionally agreed, did you catch that word conditionally? United has conditionally agreed to purchase 100 ES-19 ES means electrical, and S, I don't remember what that stands for. Uh, 19 is the number of seats it has. United has conditionally agreed to purchase 100 ES-19 aircraft once the aircraft meets the airline's safety, business, and operating requirements. So now, what do you understand this to tell you? This is a non-story. It turns out that within about by 2026, in five years' time, Hart Aerospace is hoping to have this plane up and running. United has conditionally agreed, meaning there's been no transfer of money yet, but once the aircraft meets the airline's safety requirements, meaning that it can do the distance and land with a healthy battery reserve, once it's met the airline's business requirements, namely its cost of purchase, its cost of operation, and uh, its um, uh, lifetime reliability, how often the battery needs to be replaced, and so on. And thirdly, once the, airline, once the airplane has met United Airlines' operating requirements, namely that it can be turned around very rapidly. Now, would you like to know how long it takes to charge the battery in the um, ES-19 seat uh, hot aerospace airplane? And the answer is about 14 hours. Now, I should tell you that if you try and do it more quickly than that, uh, the battery degradation is so rapid as to be absolutely unfeasible. 
uh, this is why it is that when you charge your cell phone, it's a lithium-ion battery, same technology, you plug it not into the wall, but you plug it into a transformer, and that regulates the amount of current that will go in and charge the battery. You could charge the battery much more quickly, but it will be dead within a week or a month. you got to charge a lithium-ion battery fairly slowly if it's going to survive. So about 14 hours. Now, do you know how long, you know, on a successful airline like um, Southwest, for instance, running a fleet mostly of Boeing 737s, do you know how long the turnaround time on average is? In other words, how long does the airplane spend on the ground? Obviously, if you're running an airline, time on the ground is time wasted because the airplane is making money when it's in the air. So you want as little time as possible on the ground. And so they uh, get people off a plane quickly. The refueling starts even before the last passenger is off. And uh, how long does it take to fully refuel a Boeing 737? Uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Now, usually they don't have to fill it because they put in the amount of uh, aviation avgas needed uh, for the journey plus a safety reserve. They don't fill it every time because then the airline is using valuable fuel to do nothing but fly fuel from one city to another. So generally, uh, it takes a lot less than 45 minutes to refuel a 737. And that's why uh, Southwest Airlines and many other airlines are able to run a turnaround time of an hour, hour, hour and a quarter, maybe 90 minutes max on the ground. And then the plane's on its way again. Right. And uh, United Airlines came up with their own innovative way of loading passengers. Again, the idea being to uh, to make that all run as uh, quickly as possible to minimize the turnaround time. So a Boeing uh, 737 can uh, turn around in about, uh, you know, maximum amount of time to refuel it, say an hour. Um, Basic time to recharge the battery of a 19-passenger commuter airline with a range of 200 miles, about 14 hours. So that's why United Airlines hasn't actually purchased. They purchased conditionally. Now, remember, I told you there was also a Reuters report. United Airlines to buy 100 19-seat electric planes from hot aerospace. Well, I thought, why don't I dig down into the Reuters story and close to the end. Here comes the sentence. United would not disclose the value of the order, which is conditional on the aircraft's meeting safety, business, and operating requirements. So what United is is really saying is absolutely nothing. Basically, what they're saying is, hey, when you've got an airplane that can deliver our safety requirements and can do so at a price that makes business sense to us and it satisfies our operating requirements, then we'll buy them from you. (laughs) Right? It's, you know, it's, you can think of so many Uh, similar arguments you might say well um, I am going to buy right I think you know you might say I'm going to buy a Beverly Hills mansion conditional on the sale in 10 years time uh, being uh, able to meet my financial requirements and my ongoing desire to own a Beverly Hills mansion and the availability of a zero interest loan yeah it means absolutely nothing And yet the headline is what has been flashing around the world this last week. Oh, United is buying 100 electric planes. I have no problem with electric planes. You know, let's see. Yeah, good luck to them. My only concern is that I want to do everything possible to help my happy warriors avoid the trap of believing hype and hype is just a polite word for lies that headline is a lie united airlines to purchase under electric planes from hot aerospace it's a very long shot that may happen but they're certainly not making any commitment to do so at the moment and uh, you know look what hot aerospace is up against 
uh, the price of the airplane isn't even been announced yet hasn't been announced because <laughs> you're talking about an extremely expensive piece of equipment by contrast for much less money united could buy a plane like say a cessna sky courier which is a two engine gasoline driven airplane it carries 19 passengers for 950 miles 950 miles Do you remember how far the heart aerospace was going to carry they're aiming at 200 miles 19 passengers 950 miles at a higher speed than the electrical plane refuels yep you can refuel a cessna sky courier in 15 minutes <laughs> is united really going to buy these planes from heart aerospace i wouldn't bet on it maybe they will but I wouldn't bet on it because it doesn't look very likely. Now, I know people are saying, well, you know, you're saying everything you're saying is true today, but battery technology is going to change. That's what you hear people saying all the time. Now, I am not going to um, take the time, and I think it would be an uninteresting show if I were to go on and explain why it is that while we may get an improvement in lithium-ion battery technology of a few percentage points a year, perhaps, uh, there's not going to be enough of a change to make a difference here. I'm not going to go into that, but I'll just give you an example, if I may. In 1620, the Mayflower landed in New England, North America, um, from Europe, they left England and they crossed the Atlantic. It took 66 days to cross the Atlantic. And then they started uh, the Plymouth Colony in New England. And here's what they said to one another. Now, I'm making this stuff up, but it's very plausible. They said to one another, yeah, look, of course it took 66 days for us because this is still fairly early in the days of transatlantic sail journeys. But wait, sales will improve and boat building will improve and eventually sales will be able to take people across the Atlantic far more quickly than 66 days. And you know, they were right because by about 1800, sailboats were crossing the Atlantic in a little more than four weeks. So you know, call it 30, 32 days, typically. So about half the time, 1620, the journey of the Mayflower took 66 days. By uh, 1820, actually slightly earlier that e than that even, uh, sailboats are doing it in about 30 days, shall we say. So, yeah, you're right, a big improvement. But it's still a long time to cross the Atlantic, much better than 66 days, but 30, 31, 32 days, it's a month, month at sea. And they all, don't worry, sail will improve. Well, it did, but not enough to, to really matter. And there's no way that the wonderful people who crossed the Mayf with the Mayflower could have imagined that there is going to be something called steam power. They couldn't have imagined that. And so finally, finally, in 1838, the first fully steam-powered crossing of the Atlantic took place. It was a ship called the Great Western, and it was done in 15 days. Now, no sailboat is ever well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I mean, uh, a modern racing boat could conceivably do that. And I, I'm trying to recall if I, if I remember speed records across the Atlantic for modern racing boats. But in terms of a boat that can actually carry passengers and take people across the Atlantic, no, um, <laughs> not, not, not going to happen in 15 days. It just doesn't happen. But uh, 1838... And the Great Western crosses in 15 days. So in 1620, it took over two months, 66 days, and 200 and, uh, 
and 18 years later, 200, 200 odd years later, the Great Western does it in 15 days. But not the way they thought. They thought that one day they'll cross the Atlantic in 15 days by sail. Never going to happen. You follow? And so when the great British engineer, Isambard, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, very quaint name, um, but everyone knows him as Brunel, a great engineer of the 19th century. He built the SS Great Western, the steamship Great Western. Yeah, 15 days, but it didn't use sails. It was the first time steam power alone took a ship across the Atlantic, 15 days. So they were right that the speed would improve. They were wrong about the technology that would make it happen. And so all I'm saying is that uh, I am not at all sure. I wouldn't dream of, of negatively predicting on electrical airplanes. I just don't think it's going to be on the technology we currently have. It's like sail versus steam. There are so many problems with sail. There are so many problems with lithium-ion technology for a battery for an airplane. By the way, it goes without saying that uh, it's far, far simpler to overcome the problems of battery uh, power transport with a car than with a plane, because weight is not the same problem with a wheeled vehicle as it is with an airplane. Weight is a huge problem. And uh, at the moment, even with the advances made in batteries, um, a battery doesn't even have 7% of the power that would be contained in the same weight of gasoline. So you see, it makes sense why Hart Aerospace is hoping to get 200 miles range out of the airplane, whereas a, a fairly basic Cessna Sky Courier carries the same number of passengers at a higher speed for five times the distance, nearly a thousand miles, <laughs> let alone the fact that it refuels in 15 minutes, whereas the hot aerospace ES-19 recharges its battery, not in 15 minutes, but in 15 hours. And so that's why when you see headlines that read, United Airlines to purchase 100 electric planes from hot aerospace, don't believe it quite so quickly. That's, that's all I'm saying. And something else I'm saying is, please do visit... Uh, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, look for the online program, Scrolling Through Scripture. And the reason is because we have arranged for the moment for you to be able to enjoy the first of 20 lessons uh, absolutely free. Just enjoy it right now. And uh, I want you to do that because it's really one of the most important teachings that I have done. As you know, I explain how it is that Western civilization is a product of the Bible. That's where it comes from. Now, I'm not going to take the time to again go through that. I've done it in previous shows, but it is a hugely important book. Now, one of the reasons that the secular left has effectively trivialized the Bible in the last uh, four or five decades um, is because their access to it is limited to translations. And in translation, uh, much of it is, in fact, quite baffling. And so what I do in scrolling through Scripture is give you access to the first 34 verses of Genesis through the lens of ancient Jewish wisdom. In other words, obviously I know full well that you are not fluent in Hebrew, but I have found a way of giving you access to what is contained within the Hebrew. Now, you know, there, there are certain... Uh, full color slides that go along with it so as you can actually see what it is I'm talking about and what makes this so dear to my heart is that for the um, for the 15 years that I served as a congregational rabbi in California the entire uh, community that entire Hebrew congregation that I 
planted along with my friend Michael Medved is um, the fact that the centerpiece of everything we did was Bible study. That's exactly what we did. But we did it in a unique way, a way that was simply not accessible anywhere else. And in other words, the idea of looking at every single word, at every single letter, at the structure of words and letters and sentences, going to the real meaning. In other words, we all know in the beginning God created heaven and earth. But why doesn't it just say in the beginning God created the universe or God created everything or in the beginning God created all there was to be created? Everything you see God created in the beginning. No, it's specifically heaven and earth. Why tell us that everything was chaotic and topsy-turvy at the beginning? What does that actually mean? And uh, so on and so forth as we go through. Uh, why does it use day one in the, um, in the cardinal form instead of the ordinal first day? After all, it says second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Why didn't it say first day? It doesn't. It says day one. What's the difference? Why is that? And, and so it is many, many, many important points, all of which, by the way, have practical implications. Please know this is not a discussion of theology. We're not talking about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And we're not asking, why did God create the world? You know, when he wants you to know that, he'll probably tell you. But uh, what we're talking about is, if this is the manufacturer's instruction manual, if this is the fundamental depiction of reality in a comprehensible matrix accessible to everybody, then it's got to make a difference. And after studying for a half an hour, which is the length of this first lesson, which you can listen to, I mean, literally, as soon as we're done with this show, go ahead and uh, access the free um, uh, first lesson of scrolling through Scripture. Um, there might actually even be a link to it in the description below of this particular show. And uh, just go ahead, enjoy it. And the question you should be able to ask and answer at the end of that is, okay, and by the way, after every single bit of Bible study you do, you should be able to say, okay, so what? How does this change my life? And if you cannot answer that positively, then you've been wasting your time. You've not been studying Bible the way you ought to. And so this is something of interest not only to uh, believers, not only to Bible-centric people like me, but um, the overwhelming majority of the folks who studied with me uh, in my uh, congregational days in California were not religious Jews. Now, later on, they became so, uh, and the, the Bible is a wonderful uh, evangelizing tool in that sense, uh, because if you really get into it, you cannot help but say to yourself, okay, no human being wrote this. Well, once you say that, <laughs> your life is pretty impacted. And, um, and I think you will see during this uh, first lesson that you can listen to, you know, whenever you want, uh, I think you will see that that is the direction in which it's going. So regardless of what your own beliefs are, you cannot possibly be indifferent to the importance of this monumental volume that has played such a vital role in the story of humanity. And so there it is, scrolling through Scripture, and Lesson 1 or Episode 1, free readily available and uh, you must please write and tell me that's the only thing i ask okay write and tell me how you like it do i want strokes do i want warm feelings yes absolutely i do i want to hear from you that it was wonderful and that you found it really meaningful and that these are the ways in which it's impacted your understanding of reality so uh, all of that scrolling through scripture free lesson in Enjoy it, and uh, do please let me know exactly how it worked for you. So, uh, hey, mommy, uh, what what's electricity? Uh, well, it's uh, stuff that comes through those wires. You see those wires coming to the house? Well, electricity comes in those wires, and then it comes to those sockets in the wall. No, do not push your bobby pin into the hole in the wall. Do not do that. And um, that's what electricity is. Well, is it really? 
Electricity is a very convenient way of moving energy from where it originates to where it can most easily be used. Well, you know, what is energy? Well, energy can do work. Energy uh, could be heat, it could be movement. And um, in early factories, in, um, you know, there are many places, particularly on the East Coast, that are named by a mill. You know, you've got Owings Mill. There are many, many places because there were little towns that sprang up around a mill on a river. There was a, a decently flowing river and an enterprising man built a water wheel that was turned by the passage of the river. And that water wheel uh, turned a big axle inside the building. And then he was able to do things in its most basic form. That uh, axle was used to turn grinding stones because one of the most basic needs of a growing community is the ability to convert wheat into flour so that the baker can then use it to bake bread. And so they would take the turning uh, axle on which the water wheel was spinning and connect it to the grindstone, which would then turn and uh, grind the flour. Later on, um, factories developed. And so in that building, they might have a factory that spins um, wool into fabric or into yarn. Now, that also needs movement. So they'd have a system of rotating rods or axles or even belts to transfer turning power from where it was being produced by the turning wheel into where it was needed but what happens if in you're in your house three blocks down the road and you need turning power as well um, for whatever reason it might be well we can hardly run a rotating axle down the main street of town so how do we get the power to you you know what might you use it for well I mean, at its most basic, you could have two, you could make two discs turn and rub against each other, which would produce heat. And then you could have a fan turning, which would blow air over that heat. And then you could direct that warmed air through your house. This would be the most incredible heating system. Certainly for the uh, 18th or 19th, 18th century, I should say, uh, 17th century. Absolutely. But you can't run rotating rods or moving belts through the main street of the village. And so there was no way of getting the power from that water wheel to your house where you might have been able to use it. And then all of a sudden, we got something called electricity. And now the rotating water wheel was used to turn a generator, and a generator converts motion into an electrical potential difference. Um, It essentially sucks electrons from one side, pushes them out the other, and so that socket in your wall, and I'm being very basic here, um, has pushes out electrons out of one side, sucks them back on the other, and on their way, in the same way that moving water can turn a wheel, Moving electrons can also, by the magic of something, called an electrical motor. And so it goes, and it works really beautifully. Because you can run a wire down a street or underground much more easily than you can a rotating axle or a moving belt. And so uh, that's what electricity is. Now, the mistake that people make, and by the way, this is so widespread... I politely and gently ask people this whenever I get an opportunity. And that is like, where does electricity come from? And people uh, look at me like, what sort of question is that? You know, just there's electricity. Well, a lot of people said to me, well, this is a common answer. Well, you know, where does where does gas come, natural gas come from? Our house has a place where natural gas comes in and it goes to our kitchen and our heating furnace and it's got a place where electricity comes in. That's all there is to it. Well, it's kind of a difference because there is a reservoir of natural gas underground and all we have to do is drill down to tap it and then you've got natural gas which we can then put into containers or send down natural gas pipes and um, you can burn it in your house. You get heat. That's what you do. 
But electricity, there's no reservoir of electricity anywhere. Remember what I said? It's a way of conveniently moving energy from one place to another. And a battery is simply a way of storing up electrical energy when you have it for a time when you will need it. That's all that a battery is. A battery doesn't create electricity. A power station, a power utility, the company that you pay, well, that creates electricity by rotating a generator. How do they rotate the generator? Well, either with a diesel engine or a turbine engine, both of which burn, you got it, either natural gas or coal or petroleum because there are reservoirs of coal underground and there are reservoirs of natural gas underground and there are reservoirs of gasoline and petroleum underground but there are no reservoirs of electricity <laughs> and so this is one of the things that so many people don't seem to get i know that happy warriors get it because you all know how the world really works but most people really don't get that and they assume that electricity just has it's sort of just there it's just brought to your house no it is created by using up things that are available from a reservoir coal petroleum natural gas and then it uh, is moved to your house but the idea that electricity is great because it doesn't burn carbon-based fuels. And I've, by the way, in response to David in Los Angeles, no more will I use the word fossil fuel. The word fossil fuel was devised by the secular left and by the aggressive progressives in order to make it sound like something primitive and, and useless and old-fashioned. I'm never going to say fossil fuels anymore. It's a bad word, and it's not a word we should ever have allowed into common usage. Because now everyone knows oh, fossil fuels, they're bad, right? Well, fossils are not useful live things. Fossils are from a dead and forgotten past. No. Okay, so... Uh, uh, electricity is, is clean because it doesn't have any carbon emissions. <laughs> All right. I mean, yeah, look, I'm sorry, but people are ignoramuses. Not happy warriors, but people are ignoramuses. And they don't realize that um, uh, coal produces about 20% of America's electricity. <clears throat> As this, by the way, figures from 2020. Coal produces about 20% of our electricity. Natural gas, right, which burns, and it's natural gas, it's a, it's, it's a carbon-based fuel. Natural gas accounts for 40% of our electricity. So, so far, uh, every time you turn on a light or plug in a hairdryer, 60% of the electricity is produced by burning coal or natural gas. Another 20%, I mean, I know what you think. Okay, come on. You've got to tell us that if 60% is produced by burning coal and natural gas, then at least 40% is produced by windmills and solar panels, right? Well, no, as a matter of fact, another 20% is produced by nuclear energy, which is, by the way, what should be producing 100% of our electrical needs, obviously. And... Um, uh, China, China's building a coal-powered uh, electrical generating station at the rate of one a day. <laughs> it's true. And uh, they're also building nuclear power stations. But in America, um, the, uh, the, the, a, 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 a television comedian, very bright guy, not somebody I agree with on very much, but I did agree with him when he said that America has become a silly nation. China is a serious nation, and I think his, uh, his labeling of silly and serious nations is very good. America, indeed, is a silly nation, and, um, and it doesn't mean we're silly people in America. It means that as a, as a socio-political entity, the country has become silly, and so uh, only 20% is nuclear, 
20% is coal, 40% is natural gas. Well, that, when you add it up, is 80%. So please tell me that 20% comes from wind power, please. Well, as a matter of fact, no. Um, 8% comes from wind power, which is more than I thought. But uh, it's a paltry 8% of our electrical needs comes from wind power. And the reason your electrical bills are higher than they need to be is because the windmills are subsidized by your electrical, your electricity bill. So 8% of our power is wind and uh, solar, barely 2%. That's, you know, so, so what about all the rest of it? You know, wh- what about the other, um, you know, 8 or 9 or 10%? Where, where, where does that come from? And the answer is hydro. Well, I spoke about reservoirs of uh, energy, like coal, like natural gas, like petroleum. But there's one other form of energy that is provided for us, and that is the real solar energy. I'm not talking about silly panels on your roof for which you get a tax deduction, which gives you a rough idea of how economically unfeasible they are, because if they weren't, everyone would put them on with with or without a tax deduction. Uh, The real solar power is something called rain. Yes, the sun evaporates water out of the ocean, which is lowest level, right? Ocean sea level. And it carries it up to the clouds. And the clouds blow inland. You know what makes the clouds blow? Yeah, the sun. That's right. Sun causes wind. And, um, and then eventually those clouds disgorge all the moisture contained within them. And all of that goes into rivers and lakes that may be high up in the hills and the mountains. And then we let it flow out. And instead of turning a water wheel to make a uh, grinding stone turn to make fl- uh, wheat into flour, we have a turning a generator. That's called hydroelectric power. You want to know how Las Vegas survives? Um, in the last week, Las Vegas has seen temperatures staying over 100 degrees day after day after day. So how do people live in Vegas? easy it's called air conditioning or oh, air conditioning uses a lot of electricity you bet it does no problem you know why because there's a lake called lake mead and it's on the colorado river and way back they built a dam called the hoover dam now i would love to find out i doubt that it's even possible but how can it be that when Maya lansky and bugsy siegel were envisaging a grand gambling metropolis in the desert that just at the right time the federal government decided to build a Hoover Dam and create Lake Mead, which made Las Vegas possible. Lake Mead provides as much water as they need. The dam provides hydroelectric power as the water rushes out of the bottom of the dam it turns generators and there's more than enough electricity to run all the air conditioners in las vegas so that's another form of power but for that you have to build dams and even though enough snow falls on the western slopes of the sierra nevada mountains every year to melt into water and to provide all the water needs of all the Western United States, plus all the electricity needs, all they got to do is build a few dams. But, of course, part of being a silly nation is you don't do that. And uh, China, China's building dams, but America, not so much. And so, uh, so, uh, so California has about the same amount of dam capacity as it had when its population was half the size of what it is now. In other words, California has doubled in population, and they've, in that period of time, they've not built a new dam. It's a silly nation, and so uh, sad, but uh, very true. Now, so there it is, um, out of our uh, the electricity we use, um, 60% of it is coal and natural gas and petroleum, uh, 20% is nuclear, um, about 8% is wind, and all the rest is hydroelectric, right? You'd think there could hardly be a nicer form of electricity than hydro. 
In fact, it drives a lot of power generation in Western Canada and also in the um, Quebec region of Canada. Uh, in fact, when New York State buys power from Canada, which it does all the time, what they're buying is hydroelectric electricity. But again, uh, you and me at home, turning on our hair dryers, turning on our heating systems, turning on whatever we're doing, uh, we don't really think much about where it's coming from. But it's as well to understand what electricity really is. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, number one, I don't want you to be fooled by newspapers. Um, in 1941, in June 1941, Germany invaded, Germany violated the von Ribbentrop Molotov Pact and they invaded the Soviet Union. It's a, it's, a, it's a long discussion. I've spoken about it in the past. I hope to speak about it again. Um, it was a very important thing, particularly since uh, in uh, 1812, Napoleon did exactly the same thing, invaded Russia in the summertime, bogged down in the Russian winter, which eventually defeated Napoleon and Hitler. Uh, by December time, Hitler's advance into Russia, this is December 1941, uh, just about the time of Pearl Harbor, Hitler is um, stalled. Now, the reason I tell you all this is that Goebbels used to run uh, propaganda. And I've told you in the past that it's a very dangerous sign when the media, when news and entertainment media are essentially at one with government you got an incredibly dangerous situation. Enough said. That's what you had in the Soviet Union. That's what you had in Nazi Germany. And Goebbels was really surprised. He didn't want anyone in Germany to be frightened by what was happening on the Eastern Front. The fact is that um, Hitler bit off more than he could chew in invading the Soviet Union, and uh, he didn't want a loss of morale. So he wanted to speak to all the newspaper editors to tell them what he wanted them to write. But what he discovered was something very interesting, because the media had already decided that they were in cahoots with the government, just as can be seen in, shall we say, certain other modern countries in 2021. And uh, he discovered that of their own accord, the editors of German newspapers, in showing maps of what was happening on the Eastern Front, they dramatically diminished the size of Russia. Russia is a huge country, but they depicted it as a smaller country because that would make it look as if the Fuhrer could really conquer Russia. If you'd look at the real map and you'd see the infinitesimally small advances into a huge country, you'd you'd shudder in terror and you'd say we're doomed as indeed was the truth it's just it's interesting to see um you, not to be fooled by newspapers that's the worthwhile thing to remember not to be fooled by newspapers so uh, that's the first thing i wanted to emphasize for every happy warrior and that is you know don't be fooled by newspapers or by media or by headlines and just get accustomed to probing it and thinking it through for yourself do not be in thrall to experts or scientists or studies because studies lie and experts lie and yes even scientists lie that's right and i i've spoken about that extensively in an earlier podcast but number two, the second thing I want to emphasize is that uh, the reason I discussed planes and batteries and headlines is that we always remain focused on how the world really works. And part of that is understanding the blessing of energy. Now, here again, there are two completely opposing and mutually incompatible views on energy. One is a religiously based, a Judeo-Christian Bible-based view of energy, and the other is a secular progressive view of energy. Now, I should tell you that um, universities, which today are the temples of progressivism, 
and secular fundamentalism, they are temples of a religion. I want to make that absolutely clear. Universities are no longer objective institutes of knowledge and, and wisdom. No, not at all. Uh, universities are the temples of a religion called secular fundamentalism. And every now and then, universities send out research parties uh, or they do studies on various religions. And uh, I, I've come across probably over a hundred um, disparaging and, uh, and, and um, supercilious studies about evangelical Christianity done by various universities because they don't understand it. They don't get the idea that people will act in ways they consider to be irrational because it is in accordance with their relationship with God. And I've always, I've, I've smiled at this concept myself because what really should happen is that if I wasn't so busy, I should be the one sending out research parties to understand the weirdness of a secular worldview. I mean, it's bizarre when you think about it. It's so strange. And, um, and there really should be all these studies being conducted by Bible-centric people uh, trying to understand what overtook America in 1960s, 62? What overtook America? What madness crept into the minds of men that turned them into these empty, hollow shadows of reality? Human beings with absolutely no contact with the spiritual. <laughs> weird, I tell you. Weird. Absolutely weird. But who's got the time to do that? And so there are two separate incompatible views on energy. Let me tell you what the religious one is, first of all. The religious one is that ultimately the good Lord does not want us to be burdened by sheer animal-like drudgery. He does not want us to waste our lives walking from one place to another. He doesn't want us to waste our time uh, bending over the river and doing our laundry. And he doesn't want us building fires every time we want to have a hot cup of tea. And so he prepared for us the great gift of energy. And uh, the great thing is that oil, God placed oil in the world, not for any animal, because until human beings arrive, there is no use for oil. Animals have absolutely no use for it at all. It's only human beings who say, aha, this is energy. We can set fire and burn it and obtain energy. We can get heat. We can get movement through a steam engine. We can get work. We can even generate electricity. All of these things. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, that's the religious viewpoint. And that is that it's a blessing to use energy. And that, number two, there is no shortage of it, right? There's still plenty coal. There's plenty oil. Well, there might be a shortage of it in 200 years' time. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if there is, guess what? Nuclear energy will then be in use because we won't still be a silly nation. We'll become a serious nation. How do I know that? The answer is painfully clear. You probably know it as well as I do. Silly nations don't survive. It's as simple as that. And so ultimately, when the affluence begins to subside, as it is already doing, and uh, all of a sudden bread becomes an issue, that's when silly nations turn serious. And so all of that uh, will be fine. But what is the secular worldview? Well, this goes back to uh, old philosophical battles between Jerusalem and Athens, and uh, I've just finished telling you the Jerusalem approach to energy. It's a blessing. We use it with delight and with pleasure and with gratitude to God. And uh, the secular fundamentalist religion's view of energy, well, that's best captured by Athens or by uh, Greek mythology. Uh, 
And you'll remember Greek mythology stands as a mirror image to Jerusalem, mirror image to Judeo-Christian Bible-based culture. Judeo-Christian Bible-based culture has us saying to ourselves, how can we make ourselves more like God? Right? When you get right down to it, we, we want to be more like God. We want to be good and big and giving and abundant. We want to be like God, and he wants us to be like him. What is the secular viewpoint? The secular viewpoint is, let's make God like us. And so, in Judeo-Christian belief, we try and get rid of those base human characteristics like greed and lust and, uh, and nastiness and cruelty. We want to get rid of those things in us. We try and extirpate them from our hearts. And we try and become generous and giving and bigger people and, uh, and, and people less in the grip of our own appetites. That's all. Those are the things we try and do. Greek mythology is exactly the reverse. 180 degrees around. Their gods demonstrate all the worst of, of the lowest human characteristics. Greek gods in Greek mythology, they're all about, uh, in fact, yes, lust and jealousy and cruelty and every possible bad characteristic is how the gods behave. You understand what this basically does is uh, legitimize all behavior. And when it comes to energy, Greek mythology has the view, which is exactly the view carried by today's intelligentsia, by today's um, uh, elite in, in many, many countries around the world, which is we don't mind going to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, on our private jets because the world needs us. But ordinary people must buy carbon offsets if they have the audacity to buy a, pl a ticket on a commercial airliner. Ordinary people must stop using so much energy. Ordinary people must switch to electric cars as if electricity comes from a hidden reservoir somewhere in the bowels of the earth. It doesn't apply to us. Well, sure enough, in Greek mythology, energy in the form of fire, fire is the ultimate form of energy, uh, energy belongs only to the gods. And Zeus, the king god, the main god, is in charge of all the energy. And human beings may not. Mere mortals have no right to the energy. Isn't that exactly what our elite tell us now? They use the energy, right? Al Gore, who makes a lot on carbon offsets, he uses a huge amount of energy. But he explains, uh, Kerry, right, the guy who used to uh, be in various democratic administrations, and maybe he is now as well, who knows, who cares, but uh, John Kerry also, he needs to use a, uh, a private jet because he has important work to do. The gods always think they're immune to the rules they impose on mere mortals like us, and so... Uh, Zeus says, yeah, the energy is for the gods, not for you people. A brave human being called Prometheus decides that people need fire as well. And he, the, the whole story is that he goes and, and steals the fire from um, uh, Zeus, and he gives it to humanity, but he uh, is captured in the process, and he is undergoing eternal, everlasting torture um, inflicted on him by Zeus. That's how they look at it. Um, in our viewpoint, and I'll, I'll give you a little glimpse into some ancient Jewish wisdom here, which you might enjoy, I do, and that is that, uh, as you know, Adam and Eve uh, violate a, a rule of God. They are tossed out of the Garden of Eden, and they're being uh, banished. They have to face a reality in a cold, harsh world where things are not provided quite as beautifully and as easily as they were in the Garden of Eden. From now onwards, mankind is going to have to work, and by the sweat of his brow, he's going to eat bread, by the way, which is one of the reasons that bread is sort of sacramentalized in both Judaism and Christianity. Um, at any rate, um, ancient Jewish wisdom, based on some verses that I am teaching in the Scrolling Through Scripture program, uh, Adam says to God, how are we going to survive? 
how are we going to survive out there? First of all, there's wild animals. And secondly, the food, everything was ready to eat in the Garden of Eden. But out there, you know, turnips and carrots are hard. How are we going to survive? And God says, come here, let me show you something. I have a gift for you. Uh, and out of God's goodness, he takes Adam and they crouch down, as it were, and God sets up some kindling and pieces of wood and then God takes two stones and hits them together a few times and sparks jump out and ignite the kindling and a big cheerful bonfire leaps up. Adam jumps back in horror and says, what's that? What's that? And God says, this is fire. This is energy. It's my gift to you because of my love for you. That's what energy is, my friends. And we have to understand that so well. That's part of what this is all about and why it is that uh, I decided it was worthwhile for us to spend a little time together looking into the mistakes that are made when people don't understand energy. If energy, is instead of being a gift of a good and loving God for our convenience, so as we don't have to engage in drudgery, and instead, it's something intended only for the gods that is only allowed to human beings with great reluctance and under bad circumstances. Well, then you shouldn't make any calculations based on convenience. It should all be based on saving the planet. And so this insane obsession with electrical cars and electrical planes now is not a rational decision. If it was, the government wouldn't have to extract $7,000 from me to give to the next person who buys a Tesla. That's exactly what's happening, by the way. 7000 tax break for buyers of electrical cars. So this obviously is not an economic benefit. This is because we, we are going to force people into electrical cars. And we, we, for years, we've been trying to move in that direction by applying what are known as the CAFE, the CAFESAN at CAFE, having to do with the government telling car manufacturers what kind of uh, fuel economy they have to deliver. Why? Why is it the government's problem? That's not the government's job. Well, it is. If the government has a state religion, then they apply that religion. And the religion is thou shalt not use energy. It's none of your business. If I'm willing to pay my own gasoline bill, I can drive a V12 car. I don't care. It's none of your business. Oh, it is. We're going to make that V12 car unavailable as much as the car manufacturer may want to build it. And as much as customers may want to buy it, we will prohibit it because it uses too much energy. Why doesn't the government decide I'm using too much coffee? although they'll probably do that under the public health rules, because now since COVID, the government has learned that there is nothing that is withheld from them as long as they use the public health slogan. Who knows? But energy is in a special category. It's different from coffee, right? Am I using too much wool? I've got a scarf and a sweater and woolen socks. Maybe I'm using too much cow wool, uh, excuse me, sheep wool. No, government cares about energy because that's a big religious issue. The religion of secular fundamentalism says thou shalt not use energy. And the religion of Bible-based Judeo-Christian thinking is, yes, thou shalt use energy because that way thou will not waste time on drudgery and you will be able to use your time for doing what you should be doing, building God's kingdom on earth and building your relationship with the Almighty. That's what we should be doing. But, of course, in the world of secular fundamentalism, everything is different. So, you get the idea, right? Um, I don't want you to be fooled by newspapers. I want you to be under understanding and aware of how newspapers are hand in glove and shoulder to shoulder with the powers that be, with government, and that uh, everything you read is shaped by the desire to go along with a government official view. Um, do you know how much the government spends and has spent on every COVID vaccine? You don't, do you? Me neither. Very hard to find out. 
But do you think the huge sums of money involved might have anything to do with government hostility to hydroxychloroquine and other uh, cheap methods of dealing with COVID? Do you think it might have something to do with why you would not find on Facebook or YouTube doctors that uh, promoted the use of um, uh, hydroxychloroquine? These doctors were removed or Facebook removed off YouTube. Yeah, because media hand in hand. with You've got to understand all of that. Number two, uh, understanding the blessing of energy, as I've just explained. And, um, and number three, to be aware of how many problems are caused by people who are trying to make the world a better place. What? What's wrong with making the world a better place? Because invariably... People who are trying to make the world a better place of minding your business. They're trying to impose on your freedoms because they will decide what makes the world a better place, not you. And that's why it is that you are best served when everyone around you is trying to make more money. You know, and you hear me say that, and some of you are going to, how crass, you know, that's really crass. I mean, he just cares about money. Doesn't he care about people? Doesn't he care about things that really matter? Yeah, in a hard-to-understand paradox, which is part of how the good Lord created the world, the best way that you can take care of your business and helping other people is by trying to improve your own five Fs. The more time you try to, to make more money, that means the more time you're trying to find to improve my life. Because the only way to make more money is to get me to give you my dollars. And the only way I'd do that is if you give me something of more value in return. And so I get very frightened when I hear young people saying they want to go into government. Because that means another 10 fingers in my wallet. It means another person trying to impose on my freedoms, all under the rubric of doing good and making the world a better place. I am terrified of people trying to make the world a better place. Stop doing it, please, I beg you. Stop trying to make the world a better place. The way you can make the world a better place and the way I can make the world a better place is by building and growing and taking care of my family and by building and growing and taking care of my finances, and by looking after my body, and by building and maintaining friendships with people, and yes, by making sure that I am aware at all times that God is looking over my shoulder, and that I care what he thinks about me much more than is important what I think about him. The key thing is that I have to be obsessed with what he thinks of me. And all I got to do is those things. And I'm a blessing to my neighbors and friends. But if I spend my days trying to make the world a better place, God save you. Because there's probably nothing I wouldn't do to you or your belongings as long as I can tell myself it makes the world a better place. I want to say thank you again. Uh, visit the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. Uh, get hold of the free first episode of Scrolling Through Scripture. Let me know. That's the deal, okay? You listen to it. you got to write me and tell me how you liked it. And um, uh, that's it, isn't it? That's as far as we're going to go today. So wishing you a wonderful week with your five F's, a, we a week of progress and growth and development with your faith, with your finances, with your friendships, with your family, and with your fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Till next week, God bless.